And uh, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to just pop those in the chat and I can make sure that Matt answers those questions for you. Um, Matt Bunch is a horticulturist and he uh, spends part of his time with the Giving Grove National, uh, helping us with uh, all of our affiliates and our program managers, but he also okay. runs the local Kansas City program done that for years and years and he'll tell you a little more about himself and what he does and he'll go uh, right into this presentation. So thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, please keep yourselves on mute. Uh, again, whatever you're comfortable with, if you want to have your cameras on or your cameras off while you're listening to this presentation, um, that is fine. And I will be monitoring the chat for your questions. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Matt. All right, thank you, Ashley, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your day. It is winter time. Uh, today happens to be a nicer winter day for us here in Kansas City, 35 degrees. It's not five below like it has been. So um, yeah, a little bit about uh, me, I have uh, been in the horticulture field for 30 years, since 1994, and a little bit of uh, everything from municipalities to botanical gardens, but uh, really for the past uh, 11 years have been uh, with uh, the Giving Grove program at Kansas City Community Gardens and with the national organization. Uh, with the, the local program here in Kansas City, we have installed over 250 micro orchards with different, uh, with different communities in the Kansas City area. And uh, that's over 4,000 fruit and nut trees. So, so we work with all of those communities and uh, all, of the, all of the different fruits and nuts and the pests thereof. So uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, we will kind of talk about uh, some of these pests uh, and uh, how to manage them and just some, some basic principles of pest management. All right, first off, I just want to, want to talk about what is a pest. And sure, we, we may all have sort of a, a general uh, knowledge, general definition, but uh, specifically what are pests when it comes to fruit trees. And here uh, I have some photos in set, and uh, some of these are uh, just different types of pests. So, so when we're talking about fruit crops and nut crops and vegetables too, for that matter, uh, this breaks down into primary pests, and these are the pests that attack the fruit. And so if you look at the codling moth larva down there, that is a primary pest, and it primarily feeds on the fruits. Uh, the secondary pests are, are going to be uh, some other pests that mainly attack the foliage or the roots or the trunk or the bark of the tree. So they they don't uh, they aren't involved with damaging the fruit or feasting on the fruit, but it's some other part of the tree. And so that uh, includes like the greater peach tree borer that you see right here. Yes, it can kill a tree, but it is technically a secondary pest. Also, I put a string trimmer in there. Yeah, that's a secondary pest too. So uh, we all just have to have to work on uh, talking to the lawn crews about that. So when, when we go through this presentation, I'll point out what is a primary and what is a secondary pest. So in the world, there are almost a million named species of insects. Now out of that, only 2% are pests and even less of a percentage of that is pests of food crops of things that we would be growing. So the other 98%, these are pollinators, these are predator insects, beneficial insects, these are decomposers. Uh, there, there are all sorts of insects out there in the insect world. But really for what we're focused on, we're focused on less than 2%. Uh, but these less than 2%, they can do a lot of damage to the food crops that we grow. 
And then in the fungal world, yes, there, because we'll talk about some fungal pests and some disease pests here today too. Um, there are an estimated 3 million species. Now, 8,000 are considered harmful to humans or plants. So not many percentage wise, but yes, they can have uh, some, some really long lasting and uh, severe effects on some of our fruit and nut plants. So in order for a pest to really become a pest and for an outbreak to happen, you have to have this Venn diagram, this pest triangle has to happen. Uh, so for example, if the host plant has immunity to certain diseases, and this is a, a, a big tenant with, uh, with, our, with our organization is, is having disease resistant plant material. So let's say your apple is immune to apple scab. Well, all of a sudden that host it becomes not a problem. It's not going to have that pest. Some other examples are if the pest is not present. So if there's no rain and there's low humidity, brown rot will not be a problem on your plant. Or another example of this is certain pests need specific host plants. Peach borers, for example, will not attack an apple. Now there are apple borers out there. So if you if you have an apple and you have peach borers in the area, well, that apple's not going to be affected or infected. So so all of these three need to line up. And it's when these three line up and you get that overlap of the three. Uh, then you have a problem. So the example here is uh, fire blight. Uh, so um, fire blight is a pest. It is a it is a a bacterial disease. So that pest is present, and the host must also be susceptible. So, so let's say an apple plant that has susceptibility to fire blight. And then the conditions must be right. So there must be the right amount of humidity. There must be a wetting event, rain, or just a lot of dew at the time that fire blight is being spread through pollination. Then that problem occurs. And the thing about this is you will you will find out in the orchard, uh, out in the garden that yes, you can have two of these circles that are joining, but because you don't have the environmental conditions, there is not a problem present. So so that's going to be a big takeaway from this is if, if you don't have the right environmental conditions, or if you don't have the right host plant or if the pest is not a problem in your area, then it's, it probably won't be an issue with your fruit tree. The other thing about this is knowing what the life cycle and the biology of the pest is. And this is sort of the, the uh, simplistic uh, moth and caterpillar life cycle but you could translate this into the life cycle of a fungus, the life cycle of a disease. But, but for here, let's, let's pretend that this is a coddling moth. Now, right now in this season, winter time, pretty much all coddling moths are in the, the, that pupil stage. So what do these coddling moths do? They emerge from their pupa and they emerge right around the time that bud breaks from, uh, from uh, on your apple trees. So if you can imagine that, and then what happens is these adult moths, they mate, and then there is egg laying. That egg laying oftentimes coincides with uh, the flower buds first being present on an apple or a pear or an Asian pear tree. 
And then you go through all of these stages. And then uh, it's these caterpillar stages, which those are the stages that are the problem. And that, that, that'll be sort of repetition. You'll, you'll hear this throughout this presentation. It is the caterpillars uh, that are the ones that are doing the eating, that are do, uh, causing the primary or secondary uh, plant damage. So we need to know what the pest is that causes the damage. We need to know which plants are the hosts for these pests. And then we need to know how we can disrupt that life cycle of the pest so that the crop damage is minimized. And then most importantly, right now in this season, how and where does this pest overwinter? So a pupa right now, well, it's probably going to be overwintering uh, in the ground, in, in the leaf litter, or maybe in some of the cracks in the bark or underneath a, a branch or uh, in, a, in a cluster of leaves uh, that has been woven together and stuck to a branch angle in the tree. So uh, all of this is important in understanding uh, what the pest is and, and how to minimize uh, the pest in the orchard. There are some other things that you can do to help minimize uh, damage in your orchard. And so this is basically, this is just you know, this is basic integrated pest management, but before you get into the spraying part of, <clears throat> of pest management. So first off, it's, it's all about selecting uh, plant material that has good resistance to major diseases. Now that, that's always big, you know, having something, <clears throat> excuse me, having something that is going to be resistant to cedar apple rust, for example, or have good woolly apple aphid resistance on a rootstock. These can be very important if these pests are known in your area. Some other things are avoid planting in low areas with poor soil and air drainage. <clears throat> so fruit trees do not like wet feet at all. <clears throat> Basically wet feet will start to rot the roots and then that will weaken the tree. Um, the other thing is poor air drainage. And what I mean by that is oftentimes in valleys, you will get air that settles. And that's where cool air settles an awful lot. It's also where dew settles. And the longer you have, <clears throat> the longer you have dew on your foliage, the more likely you will have some sort of foliar uh, disease or fungus that is attacking your tree, or in some cases, you'll get fruit uh, disease or fungus. So some other things are scouting the orchard weekly, and especially during the growing season. You need to be out there taking a look, see what's going on. Are there new spots on the tree? Look underneath the leaves, etc. Pruning. Pruning is, is a very big deal. If if you do not prune, you will end up having a very restricted canopy, as in restricted airflow, restricted sun, sunlight. And if you don't prune, you're not removing a lot of that diseased wood that may be in there. Thinning fruits is another important thing. If you do not thin fruits, uh, uh, clusters of fruits are where a lot of pests will, will hide. And then they'll just continue their life cycle in those clusters of fruit. Remove fallen fruits. So don't 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 be the orchard that uh, is is in that picture right there. Uh, that is basically um, that's that's just a, a place for for more or oriental fruit moths to complete their cycle, for plum cucurlio to complete their cycle, for brown rot to complete its cycle, et cetera, et cetera. And then cleaning your tools between pruning. You can pass on different diseases uh, by not sanitizing your tools or sterilizing your tools between pruning. 
mowing regularly to prevent habitat for insect pests. So you don't want to have uh, overly long turf. You don't you don't want to have knee high grass in your orchard. That that can be a great place for things like stink bugs, uh, ligus bugs, other insects like that that are major fruit pests. And so, like I said, this is just kind of the beginning of integrated pest management here. Now, scouting <clears throat> is, and I alluded to that in the previous slide, this is something where you're going to be out there once a week in your orchard from pretty much bud break until the fruit's harvested for the most part. So this is, this is looking under leaves. It's looking at new growth. It's looking at barks and limbs and, 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 and the trunk and, and any abnormalities. Oftentimes under leaves, that's where eggs are being laid. That's where you're going to find stink bug eggs for sure. Um, it's, it, and in new growth, that's where you'll find aphids for sure. Um, you know, take a random sampling of your trees and note if this is just isolated to one tree or if it's affecting multiple trees. You may notice uh, damage on a Liberty apple, but you may not notice that, you may not notice damage on a pristine apple, for example. So, okay, why is that? What is the damage? What, what, so, so just different, different plants are going to be affected by different pests. And be aware of the surrounding environment. So weather is going to be a big driver of all of this. If we have hot and humid, yes, the, the disease pressure goes up. If we have dry, incredibly dry, the mite and aphid pressure is going to go up. So, so be, be conscious of these weather events because uh, oftentimes that will dictate the pests that you will be seeing in the orchard. Hey, Matt, um, just yeah. pausing for a second, a uh, couple of good questions in here. Um, one is about, uh, you talked about thinning fruit. When you do thin fruit, uh, where do you move the fruit to? Can it be composted or will that not kill the pests? Yeah, so you can compost, but make sure you are composting it uh, in an active compost. And, and uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not suggesting just throw it in a, in a pile that's uh, sitting at the edge of the orchard because if that pile's not getting turned, uh, then it's not an active compost. Uh, honestly, most of the time, what we recommend is the fruit just gets taken out of the orchard and it gets put in the dumpster uh, nine times out of 10. Now, if you do have local livestock producers, uh, especially hog farmers, uh, you may want to form a relationship with them and because uh, those hogs will eat that cold fruit that you take out of the orchard. So uh, we're, we're working on that here in Kansas City with, with a couple uh, local urban hog farmers uh, to, to try to funnel that thinned out fruit to their hog operation. Yeah, and Matt, that kind of uh, leads to another related question, and then uh, we'll have you continue. Um, are there particular livestock species or breeds that you'd recommend or have found particularly effective for IPM? Yeah, so uh, livestock and, and trees oftentimes don't get along too well. Uh, however, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Chickens in the orchard can be good, uh, but that's really a very limited, uh, limited part of the year. And uh, that's going to be basically almost this time of year. So, so we're talking uh, before bud break, about four to six weeks before bud break. If you could introduce chickens into the orchard and especially right underneath the trees, uh, you know, maybe maybe throw a little scratch grain down, get the chickens going. Uh, and what, what chickens do is they naturally scratch things up. And in the process of scratching things up, they're finding larvae 
oftentimes this is going to be plump curlio larva. This may be uh, the pupa of codling moth or oriental fruit moth. So, so really uh, chickens will, will be uh, good friends in the orchard. Awesome, thank you, Matt, you can continue. All right, so, so another thing uh, when um, practicing some of this early uh, IPM is monitoring and trapping of pests. So of course, you know, this is, means being aware of the pest life cycles and in some cases using pheromone traps. And that's what you see with this, uh, this, this uh, Trisse wing trap here. It has a little pheromone lure. And these are, uh, there are so many different pheromone traps out there on the market, uh, but this can be very handy uh, in identifying if you have a problem. And then if you do have that problem, then you can start to take corrective action. In some cases, there are also sticky traps. Uh, these sticky traps can be good, especially when we're talking about pests uh, like, like cherry fruit fly, also known as cherry maggot, uh, um, or in some cases, the spotted wing drosophila, uh, the Japanese fruit fly. Now, another thing about these pheromone traps is they're often used with degree day modeling. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this because the, the deeper we go, the more confusing it can be. However, I just want to introduce this topic because this is really a, a good way to know when you will need to spray. Now, degree days are basically they're the accumulation uh, of temperatures above either 43 degrees or above 50 degrees, depending on, on what pest you are monitoring for. Um, but this is utilizing uh, daily records of temperature and, and adding up the cumulative degrees that, that form. Now, if you want to find out more about this, I suggest going to NUA at cornell.edu. Um, there are also a number of other uh, uh, University of California. Uh, they also have another good de degree day calculator. But this is this is only going to be, I think, so helpful for small orchards. Uh, a lot of the commercial growers really rely on degree day models. All right, so common fruit plant pests. Now notice this is quite a list, um, but it, it, it is also only a partial list. And so you look through here and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about some of the major fruit crops uh, that, that we recommend. So between uh, apple, pear, Asian pear, peach, cherry, plum, I didn't put the small fruits or brambles on here, but a lot of these fruit or some of these fruit pests do cross over into these small, uh, small fruits and brambles. But basically the top 10 we will focus on are going to be these here. And the reason why uh, I'm focusing on these is because these are kind of ubiquitous uh, nationwide. Uh, now, now, some parts of the, the country do not face the same pressure as sort of uh, uh, east of the Great Plains, uh, but uh, a lot of us do see these pests, and we see them in, in more or less, you know, more or less similar degrees. Um, so with these top 10, you'll notice where I have a double X, these are particularly a problem uh, for that particular fruit. And so I'll be going through and, and we'll be talking about each one of these one by one, uh, how to identify them and some, some actions that we can take to uh, mitigate their damage altogether. Now I included this slide because I thought if, if we're going to share this later on, this kind of breaks it down. And this, 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 uh, so it breaks it down fruit crop by fruit crop. So you can then kind of understand that, oh, peach is, is going to have 
all of these problems. In some cases, they will have some of these problems pretty severely, uh, whereas cherry maybe has less problems. Um, and, and plums may be a little bit less than peach. But then you look at apple, it's like, oh my goodness, apple has a lot of problems. Well, yeah, they do, they do. Um, and then Asian pear and, and European pear, yes, they have some of these problems, but, but notice on them, you don't see any of the two X's. So, so the, there's, there's not, uh, they don't get particularly over infested with any problem. So yeah, let's, let's get into, into some of these insect pests and, and talk about why why they are a problem. And I will say coddling moth probably ruins the fun for most apple growers around here. And I'm sure that is the case in, in most of the other regions. Um, so basically this is a moth. And as you know, moths fly at night. Um, so uh, if, we, if we refer back to our life cycle, uh, this particular uh, moth is actually in its pupa right now. It will be flying uh, uh, pretty much as soon as our, our apple trees start to break bud. And what these, uh, what these guys do is, uh, uh, so they will mate, the female will lay eggs at the base of the new, new flower or fruit. And then the larva will uh, chew into the seed chamber. Uh, depending on what part of the country you're in, there, there may be two or three generations of this per year. So this means that uh, they, once they, once they lay their eggs uh, on the fruit, uh, the caterpillar eats into the fruit, the caterpillar uh, comes out of the fruit, and oftentimes will either crawl down the tree or fall uh, onto the ground, and then it will begin a pupation. Now, um, most of the time, uh, they will they will pupate and then they will they will fly again. Um, sometimes they'll they'll mate and have another generation. Sometimes they won't. It depends on on how uh, how many degree days we do have or you have. Um, so some some handy ways to combat this are. Uh, Use monitoring, uh, use degree day monitoring with pheromone traps. You can do bark banding uh, for the pupating larva. And so that's, uh, that's as that first generation uh, of caterpillar emerges from the, the first fruits and crawls down the tree, you will end up wrapping uh, uh, some corrugated cardboard around the trunk of the tree. You leave that on the trunk of the tree for two to three weeks, and then you take it off, and you will see a bunch of uh, little larvae that will, are, are starting to um, uh, pupate. And at that point, you will, you'll take that off the tree, and you'll end up burning it or throwing it away. Now, some other things that, that you can use against codling moth are uh, things like Bt, spinosad, and neem. Um, all of these are organic insecticides, and <clears throat> basically the best time to be uh, spraying something like this is right as those, those caterpillars are first hatching out or right as the eggs have first been laid. So this is going to be at the base of a flower bud, or in some cases after petal fall, and, and petal fall is exactly what it sounds like after the petals have fallen off of the blossom. And these are two really good times to end up uh, uh, killing the larva or, or in some cases preventing that larva from going into the next stage of its life. Now the other thing I have down here is mating disruption. I put a Put a question mark here. Um, mating disruption is, is something that works. It is actually a, a pheromone disruptor uh, that is uh, put out in the orchard. However, it's not something that is uh, available in all states. 
And in some cases, it, it may not be cost effective for uh, what we're trying to do in little community orchards. But I wanted to let you know that it is out there. Uh, these products are used in a lot of organic orchards uh, on the commercial side of things. But uh, they, they, they're probably not applicable for most of our community orchards yet. <clears throat> Okay, stink bugs. And stink bugs, even, uh, even though we're going with top 10 uh, stink bugs, there are actually many species of stink bugs that can cause quite a bit of damage to your fruit, uh, making it uh, inedible, uh, definitely unmarketable. Uh, and uh, when I say inedible, uh, you'll you'll end up having maybe 50 to 75 percent of the fruit that can can get damaged by a stink bug. So you're cutting out uh, a quarter of the fruit for yourself to eat. So so it it is a problem, and there are multiple species of stink bugs. Uh, here you see the inset is um, one of the insets. Those are some uh, stink bug eggs that are on the underside of a leaf. And stink bugs, they, they tend to cause a problem more with uh, our apples, pears, and Asian pears, but they can also cause problems on peaches and plums too. Uh, you'll see with that apple, that is a classic stink bug damage. And basically what stink bugs do is they will, they will insert their mouth part and where they've done that, it releases a little bit of a toxin and that will cause damage on the fruit. It will cause the fruit to pucker. And sometimes you'll end up with little grit cells inside uh, that particular fruit. Uh, here on the other, on that little pear, the honey sweet pear, that happens to be a leaf footed bug. And it's, it's one of these stink bug complex. Um, leaf footed bugs, they can really uh, wreak havoc. On, on pears and Asian pears if they build up in, in a huge population. So the thing about stink bugs is they can be very tough to manage. Uh, we have a lot of the, uh, the southern green stink bug is sort of the first, uh, one of the first insects to really emerge uh, in most parts of the Eastern United States. And it can cause a lot of damage on new fruits uh, and can, <clears throat> can be somewhat hard to treat because we see it as an adult. But the best time to treat these is going to be uh, either in their in their egg state when you can when you're scouting and you see them, or if you if you see uh, the young and and the young and some of their first instars, the first stages are going to be more susceptible to pesticides. And, and some of these, uh, the, the main pesticides that, that really in the organic growers toolbox uh, are going to be neem and spinosad. All right, here's one that, uh, that can also ruin the party for fruit growers. And this is uh, another primary pest. It's a plum cacurleo. Now, Cacurlio is, is uh, basically a weevil species. There are lots of weevils out there. There are, there are of course, we know about the cotton bull weevil. Uh, there's the strawberry weevil. There are oak weevils. There are lots of, lots of weevil pests out there. There are sunflower weevils. <clears throat> so this is, is a problem. Uh, in a lot of our fruit crops, uh, not only not only plum, uh, but it does favor plum, but it, it will uh, also attack peaches, uh, pears, apples. You do see it in a lot of apples. So as we were uh, as we were talking earlier, um, you know this this is uh, the life cycle on this. It's basically an adult. Uh, it, 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 it overwinters as an adult, and then it emerges in the spring. Uh, so it, it kind of, it's, it's kind of this larva, well, 
it will it, it can overwinter as a larva or an adult. So depending on where we are, um, it ends up feeding early on on the buds of trees. So so you may see uh, your apple fruit buds or your pear fruit buds are damaged. Well, that can initially be uh, some of that early cucurlio feeding. Now, later on, after they have mated, the female will end up laying an egg. And so if you see there's that long snout, that long snout is used to break the tissue of the fruit. And then the female will turn around and lay an egg down in that hole. Now you see on that second photo, it's it's sort of uh, sort of a, a a little bit of a half moon uh, crescent moon type shape. Uh, that is where an egg has been laid. Now you see the photo below that. That is where the egg has been laid and the apple has calloused over uh, that wound. So that is a a very specific wound that has been caused. And then lastly, you see the uh, the inset there uh, of the of the little larva within that looks like a, a peach pit. Uh, so the the larva has eaten into the fruit. So these can be very difficult to uh, deal with when you get them in the orchard because they they emerge either as adults or they are. They are in that 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 larval state, or the, the excuse me, the pupal state, into the adult stage, and it's hard for any sort of chemical to work against them, any sort of insecticide to work against them. So a lot of the controls with this are if you have an existing orchard, make sure that you are just picking up all of the fruit that drops on the ground and get it out of the orchard. Um, some other things that you can do, and this can be a, a little bit more challenging, is uh, spraying kale and clay, also, uh, also known as surround. It is a, a wettable clay powder that gets sprayed on the tree. Now, when this gets sprayed on the tree, it coats the tree, and it's something that uh, the insects, they they will land on the tree, but it really, it disrupts it, it. Basically, they don't like the way it feels and they're not going to stick around on that tree to figure out if there's a place to lay an egg. So kale and clay serves a, a little bit as a crop protectorate. Now, uh, you spray it on and if you get hard rains after that, that does become an issue because it, it will wash right away. So you will have to reapply. Uh, kale and clay is best applied when the fruits are at about dime sized. And, uh, and then you can keep applying and you could, you could apply this for things like oriental fruit moth as well, uh, but it, it seems to really work well uh, against plum cucurlia. Another thing that can be used is spinosa, but Finding, finding that window in which you can spray because you have a hard bodied insect and then it lays its egg within the fruit. So the, the time you would be spraying spinosa is once you already have fruits on the ground. Um, one thing that has uh, proven to be fairly effective are parasitic nematodes. And, and I'll beat this drum again on these nematodes because this, this can be a nice uh, organic solution to some of our tougher fruit tree pests. Uh, parasitic nematodes are introduced to the soil and typically it's when the soil is going to be a little bit cooler and wetter. So uh, for us, that's going to be more of an April, May type situation. Uh, what these nematodes will do is then they seek out these larvae that are in the ground. And with the life cycle of the plum cucurlio, it starts, so it, it starts as that adult in the spring, 
but then when it's in that little larval state in the fruit, it will cause those fruits to drop off and those fruits land on the ground with the larva inside of them. That larva will crawl out of the fruit and then will go into the ground to continue its pupal life cycle. So when you have those nematodes in the soil and you have the plum cucurleo larva, those nematodes will then seek out that larva. And so, so this can, can be effective not only against plum cucurleo, but it can be effective against uh, some other of, of these pests that do pupate uh, in the soil. So, so if you think of, uh, think of uh, oriental fruit moth and codling moth, it can be effective there. Uh, but plum cucurleo typically always pupates in the soil, whereas oriental fruit moth and codling moth, um, they sometimes pupate within the tree or in crevices of the bark. So, and lastly, there's chickens. And, and we talked about the, earlier the benefit of chickens. And if you have that opportunity, introduce them into the orchard and, and sort of that six weeks before bud break and really get them underneath those trees, uh, get them scratching around because they will unearth some major insect pests. Hey Matt, uh, while we're while we're on this slide, there was a question related. So it's also kind of about scouting in general. Um, so what infection load do you treat? Uh, for example, if you see plum cucurleo, is it too late to treat it uh, once you've seen it? Uh, and then do you just plan preventative measures for the following season? So it's kind of a timing question with the pests. Yeah, so so with plum cucurleo, oftentimes uh once once you once you've noticed it it's it may be too late it really depends on when you've noticed it now if you see a bunch of fall so there's 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 uh, it's it's called the june drop it happens at different times uh, for different areas but it's it's right when when uh some of those young fruits drop well that's almost timed perfectly with uh, when plum cucurleo uh, is causing fruits to drop also. So uh, when you have that June drop of whatever the, the species is, be it peaches or pears or apples, um, get out there and pick those up. Because the sooner you are out there doing that, the sooner you are probably disrupting that life cycle. So if you miss two weeks in your scouting, um, that may be enough where that cucurleo larva then is able to migrate from the fruit into the soil. And then it becomes a problem for later on that season when it will become, when it will feed again on, on some of those older apples. Uh, plum cucurleo, can have another generation uh, in, in more southern areas. And so that other generation uh, would basically, those eggs would end up getting laid in kind of uh, July, August-ish. Um, and then those fruits will then again drop. Most of the time what Plum Cucurleo does in July and August is just do feeding and then it will go into the soil as an adult. Um, so that's specific with plum cucurli. Uh, so I would say we'll, we'll talk about some of these others and, and sort of the threshold there. I think um, uh, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah. All right. So, so oriental fruit moth is a, a uh, I call it a primary, for sure it's a primary, but it's also a secondary pest. So this is another one of these moth uh, species. And uh, so, so just like uh, codling moth, oriental fruit moth is, is very closely related too. Uh, so pretty much oriental fruit moth, it, it, it 
almost strictly sticks to stone fruits, but will sometimes get into apples and pears. But really, uh, it loves it loves peaches and plums and and cherries. Um, so this one uh, can can really be a challenge because it can have multiple generations a year, uh, five to seven generations a year. So just like the codling moth, it starts to fly uh, right about the time that all of the bud break the, the bud break starts happening on on a lot of our fruit trees. And as they're they're flying, once again they'll mate. And once they've mated, they will lay eggs. Typically, uh, they're called uh, tip strikes or shoot strikes. And they'll do this at the branch tips, mainly of peaches. Now, you will see this also on cherries and plums, but mostly you will end up seeing this on peaches. And uh, when, they, when they make these tip strikes, they, so what they do is they'll lay an egg. They don't always lay an egg when this happens. Um, but uh, uh, a good 50% of the time they do end up laying an egg there. So if you see flagging tips on your peach trees or on your cherry trees, that is a sure sign of oriental fruit moth. And so what happens is, is they lay this egg, the egg hatches, the little caterpillar right here is eating uh, right there in the, in the pithy part of the stem. And so it's eating. And then once it's done eating, it'll go ahead and either climb down the branch of, of a tree or fall out of the tree and it will pupate. And then uh, another generation of moths come. That, uh, that second generation of moths oftentimes lays eggs right on the fruit. And, and then that's, that's where it really becomes problematic because once, once they've done that, they'll the worm crawls in, the worm crawls out, it pupates again, uh, and, and then you have another generation and another generation. So interrupting the first cycle of this is, is very important. This is, where, uh, this is where a petal fall spray really becomes uh, important. And that petal fall spray, you know, some of us are familiar with the Michael Phillips ballistic spray, I'm not going to talk about that too much, but a petal fall spray, a BT or spinosad, uh, can be very effective at controlling that first generation of oriental fruit moths so you don't have uh, subsequent generations. Now, if you do see things like uh, shoot strikes, uh, you can prune out below where that shoot strike is and get that out of the orchard. Just uh, bring a plastic bag with you and, and throw it right away or, you know, give it to the chickens. If you have some chickens uh, in the chicken yard, they'll, they'll pick it apart and find the larva in there. Um, so the other thing is, um, you know, there's, there's always the pheromone monitoring and trapping. Yes, I think that is, that is important. But if you've been growing fruit trees, especially peaches for a while, this is a known predator and you probably do have it. Um, uh, some other things that, uh, that work, uh, um, the nematodes, I, I don't think I put that on this slide, but nematodes can also be effective at larval control if any of the larvae do end up on the ground. And actually a lot of them do after they've infested some of the fruits in their, in their later subsequent generations. All right, spotted wing drosophila, <clears throat> also known as the spotted wing fruit fly or the Japanese fruit fly. This wasn't a problem uh, 10 to 12 years ago, uh, but now it is definitely a problem throughout most of the Eastern US. This, uh, this doesn't attack too many of our tree fruits so much, but definitely uh, if you're growing brambles or any berries, it can be a major pest of those. Uh, elderberry, cherries, uh, uh, raspberries, raspberries especially because they're already a very soft body fruit and blackberries. So the thing that makes this uh, 
pest really egregious is it's not like other fruit flies. This this uh, fruit fly has a, a an ovipositor, an egg lay, uh, it's egg laying uh, appendage that actually is able to pierce the fruit. Most other fruit flies wait for the fruit to rot and then lay eggs. This one doesn't. It lays eggs into the fruit, and then uh, the the little little maggots, if you will, they um, they start crawling around eating eating the fruit, and then they complete the life cycle incredibly quickly. So this can have 17 generations a year, which makes it very, very difficult to treat. Uh, here in Missouri, uh, Lincoln University, they, they were kind of uh, on, on some of the, sort of the, the, the front edge of, of trying to figure out uh, good controls and good trapping mechanisms uh, for these pests. And they, they realized that a sugar, water, and yeast uh, in, a, in a quart, uh, like a quart yogurt container or something like that, worked really well at, at managing these when they are hung uh, underneath the shrub. So if they are hung kind of in a shady area uh, right below the shrub, this was a great way to manage. Not only, not only are, are you monitoring, uh, but in some cases, you're almost trapping your way out of the situation. Now, this is one that, that many people may not realize they have until they start picking their fruit and wondering why it's so soft. Uh, so I would say, especially if you've been growing berries for a little while, you probably do have it. The other thing is, if you've been growing vegetables, you may have this too. Um, one of the only really organic ways that you can control this other than doing some of these uh, sugar water yeast uh, sticky card traps is uh, using spinosad. Uh, and, and if you know you have a problem, yes, you would end up spraying uh, spinosad and you would wanna read some of the restrictions uh, as far as harvest intervals uh, because certain formulations of spinosad you cannot spray within a few days of harvest. Um, but you would want to want to take a look at that. All right, so now we're, we're not entirely out of the insect world. We're going to come back to insects, but here's another primary pest, and this is a fungal pest, and uh, it's no fun at all. Um, so this is this is one that affects uh, pretty much all of our stone fruits and especially stone fruits in the more humid parts uh, of the country, which, which most of us experience some good humidity during June and July. So uh, this is something where if, if we have a wet June, we will definitely have a problem uh, with our cherries. And so what this does is uh, a previous infection will actually cause the blossoms to uh, die. And you'll notice, you'll notice on let's say peaches that the blossoms open, but then they start to shrivel up. And then there'll be little cankers around. Well, that's, that's sort of how you'll notice it first. That's, that's kind of that primary infection. And then as the season goes on and those fruitlets form and we start to get wet weather, You'll, you'll, see, you'll see this spread. So basically these infections will sporulate and those spores will land on fruits. And in some cases it might just be one or two fruit, but then as the humidity starts to build up, as rain starts happening more, these spores get spread and all of a sudden you have 90%, maybe 100% of your crop that is ruined by brown. So brown rot will overwinter and it can come back year in and year out. Uh, so there, there are some ways that one, you could, you could start mitigating for brown rot early on. Uh, I'll also tell you that early, early ripening varieties are less susceptible to brown rot. So some of the, for us an early peach is late June and uh, we can always get great early peaches because brown rot season isn't quite there yet. 
but once we get into July, it, it can be a problem. So having early varieties, but also pruning. And with your peaches, make sure you're, you're pruning your peaches to an open base. Make sure they're not very crowded. You want, you want great airflow through there. Same with your cherries. You, you don't want it to be all dark and humid in the interior of that cherry. You want to make sure that the, the wind can blow through. So that's, that's going to be first. Sanitation. Remove any uh, what, what could possibly be infected branches or at the bottom there. Those are, those are old mummies. Those are old uh, dead cherries from the previous season that they're just waiting for the right conditions, for that right humidity, that those brown rot spores are going to blossom and they'll catch the wind and they'll go off to some new fruits. So, so you know, pruning, sanitation, getting the, the, the rotten fruit out. Uh, if you have a known, uh, a known brown rot problem, and especially severe brown rot problem, because I'd I don't like to recommend uh, copper fungicide too much. It, it, there are organic formulations, but in some cases you may need to spray a copper fungicide at bud break uh, to, to help get that out of your orchard, to help get that brown rot out of your orchard. And in some cases during the growing season, you may need to use something like sulfur uh, as, a, as a protectant uh, prior to some of the rain. Uh, and the rains that will cause brown rot to, to blossom. All right, fire blight. Now, just because it's a secondary pest doesn't mean it can't kill your tree. And so this is uh, this is one. And once again, uh, in our in our Venn diagram of, of, of our our disease and. Uh, uh, pest and, and host and, and conditions. Um, we know we have this around the Kansas City area. I know you have it in Georgia. I know you have it in Indiana. I know you have it in Texas. This is, but certain years it, it can, can be worse than others. Um, basically, it, this is a disease of all of the palm fruits. So you think apple pear, Asian pear, service berry, quince, medlar, all of those uh, can get this. And, and some varieties are, are going to be more susceptible than others. So basically fire blight is something that um, it, it gets spread through a number of different ways. It is a bacteria uh, and it can get spread through, through pollinators uh, going from one infected blossom to another. It can get spread by rain or hail events where a, a, a wound on the infected portion, it, it gets hit by hail or hit by rain and it splashes onto another stem and another leaf. Uh, sometimes cold injury can cause a problem. 2014 was really bad here in, in uh, Kansas City and Missouri uh, with fire blight because we had fire blight active. Then we had a snow in mid-May that actually caused a lot of tissue damage. The temperatures warmed up again. Fire blight was active again. We had damaged tissue. There were, there were horrible cases of fire blight. So anyhow... This is what fire blight looks like. Uh, often, the, and very characteristic, you see the shepherd's crook uh, that is uh, basically the infection. The infection got started through uh, a flower, and you can see some of the little fruits there, little fruitlets. Um, and then that infection travels up the stem, and then it'll go back down the twig, down into a branch, and it can get into the trunk. So it can spread and systemically kill the plant. In some cases, some plants are able to uh, sort of cauterize that wound, uh, section it off, and uh, they'll be, be able to fight it. But in some cases, they, they won't be able to. So that's what it is. 
one of the best things you can do is when you see it, prune it out immediately. Get out into the orchard and make sure, one, that the wood is not wet. Uh, so you don't want to be out there pruning fire blight on a wet day. That's probably one of the worst things you could be doing. But get out there and prune it out before it spreads even more. Uh, and make sure you're pruning uh, a good six to eight inches below the cankered area. And when I say cankered area, I'm talking about this dark area. And so prune below that. So, so find some good green wood uh, and, and prune at, into the green wood below the infection. And some other things about fire blight, there are some things that you can do culturally that can help uh, uh, mitigate any any chance that you would be getting fire blight. Uh, because in some cases, over pruning on your palm fruits can lead to a flush of new growth. That flush of new growth, uh, especially in May and June, is going to re be ripe for a fire blight infection. Uh, also, over fertilizing can, can lead to infections because you are basically forcing new growth on something and it's it's that new tender growth that is that is going to be more susceptible to that infection hey matt uh before uh before you continue i just want to let everyone know well um our goal is to uh go until 3 15. uh however i think we uh might stay on a little longer to to answer any questions that people may have um, we're, we're also recording this. I've recorded your questions. So if, uh, if you do need to hop off, um, I'll make sure that we have, uh, all of the questions listed, uh, in a follow-up email and answered along with some other resources. Uh, but just want to let you know, we we value your time. Thanks, uh, for showing up if you do have to hop off, but, uh, we'll go a little bit longer with this session. And um, related, Matt, one question uh, someone was just asking is, when you're saying get rid of diseased plants, um, what do you mean by that? Where do you put them? Uh, so, if, if yeah, if you're cutting disease out of the orchard, uh, you're, you're taking it, one, off of the premises where the orchard is. Oftentimes, uh, I mean, you could burn it. Um, uh, some yeah, some people will dig a hole and bury it. Uh, most of the time, it ends up going in the dumpster. So so, but you you don't want to just cut up diseased uh, uh, fire blighted wood and leave it there. In the orchard. So so, I mean, the the takeaway is don't leave it in the orchard and don't put it in somebody else's orchard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, peach tree borers, and, and actually uh, kind of covering two two different species here. We have the greater peach tree borer, uh, which which will kill peach trees, and is one of the reasons why peach trees only end up le uh, living about ten to fifteen years in, in, in most environments. Um, so you'll see the male and female down here, these, uh, they look like wasps. They're actually a clear winged moth. Um, so, so basically what they, these do is they, uh, they will start to emerge as these clear winged moths uh, in kind of April, May. But right now they're very much in this grub-like state, this, this, uh, and, and you see all of the, the nasty grass and dirt and those two little clump grubs. Those are greater peach tree borers. And if you look at the bottom of the trunk and if you see oozing like that at the bottom of the trunk, you have greater peach tree borers in there. So oftentimes, if you see something like this, this time of year, and you have a chance to get out there, uh, you should be actively uh, deworming your trees. Um, and it's it's just as nasty as it sounds, but it's it's really going to be the most effective way uh, to treat uh, this this time of year. If if you let these go to full uh, maturity, they will get bigger. They will keep chewing. 
uh, if they haven't girdled the tree by then, uh, the subsequent generation the next year will probably be girdling the tree. So they really love peaches, but they will also attack plums, uh, apricots, cherries, uh, so all of those stone fruits, nectarines. Um, so the adults end up uh, flying and mating April through August, and they, they lay their eggs uh, at the base of trunks or about a foot, a foot above the base all the way down to the trunk uh, in, in sort of that May through September. Um, larva will, will hatch and are active in the trunk uh, from June through April. So uh, that's, a, that's a long time for a, a larva to be just kind of going around chewing and eating. During the winter time, they're not very active, nothing really is, uh, but you will start to see more sap uh, being exuded from the base of these trees in, in March and, and early April as these larvae are getting ready to do their pupation into the full adult. So some things that to protect your trees you can do is uh, through the summer months, you could end up spraying neem, a 1% neem spray on the trunk of the tree. And this, this will help, this creates uh, a surface that the, uh, the boar will not, the boar's not gonna go there. And if there are any eggs that have been laid, the neem, will stop the, uh, the cycle of that egg. That egg will not hatch. Now, some other things are putting window screen around the trunk of the tree. And this is something you would, you would put at about uh, 18 inches uh, up the trunk all the way down to the root layer of the peach. Some chive planting around the base of the tree with periodic cutting serves as a scent disruptor and the, the female boar uh, will not be flying around to uh, lay her eggs right around there. But another thing too is, is uh, putting pea gravel around the trunk base. So that pea gravel creates a surface that then that, that female will not get to the root crown and will not be able to, to lay directly at the, at the base of the tree. I mentioned the deworming. There are pheromone traps and there are beneficial nematodes. And, and it's the same, same nematode uh, that's responsible for uh, uh, seeking out the, uh, the plum cotorleo larva would be the same, the same species that would also seek out the greater peach tree bore. Lesser peach tree boar, that's the, the other one insect here. It's uh, once again, another clear wing moth. And it's responsible for a lot of the sap oozing that happens in the upper canopy uh, of, of your peach trees. These can be uh, just as damaging uh, and actually a little bit more difficult to treat because they can be throughout the canopy of the tree. Um, Oftentimes, uh, a pheromone trap will be very, uh, very effective in letting you know you have the problem, and then you'll have to start spraying neem up on the trunks, up on the branches of your tree uh, throughout the growing season. There are other boars out there, uh, and uh, basically these can cause problems with apple, uh, and it's the flat-headed apple boar and the dogwood boar. So, um, there's, they can be treated in similar fashion, not, not exactly the same. All right, here's another secondary pest. And I'm, once again, I'm kind of lumping because there are lots of species of aph aphids out there. Um, we, we face uh, a couple of different species that are our are, are major problems, and they're uh, mostly a major problem with apples. So there's the green aphid that you'll oftentimes see on the new growth, the new apical tip growth of apples. Um, and uh, basically what they do is they feed on the undersides of the leaves. They, they suck the juices out of the leaf and it causes the leaves to kind of crinkle up 
and it's a it looks very distorted, very warty. Um, but then there's another species that can be uh, almost almost worse because it ends up attacking the roots, and that is the woolly apple leaf. Um, and you see the two pictures down below. Uh, those are uh, one you see uh, there the root systems and just that that nasty lumpy white and gray. So what woolly apple aphids do is they end up uh, they end up sucking into the very tender tissue of the bark, and that causes uh, it's basically it's a little toxin, and it causes the bark to kind of start puckering and bubbling, and then that cuts off the flow of sap uh, through the rest of the root system. So you end up with a very weak root system on an apple tree. And then you'll see something similar uh, on the new succulent uh, growing wood above ground, and that ends up making that wood really brittle. Uh, so so it, they can be very damaging. Oftentimes when you see some of these pests, the, the nice thing is you see them, and you can just take your fingers and just rub them off. Uh, in some cases, uh, that's maybe one of the easiest things you can do, especially with smaller trees. With larger trees, you can you can hit them with an insecticidal soap. You can spray them off with water too. Now, I was just at a conference and somebody said, "Oh, the worst thing you could do is, is spray your tree with water." Well, okay, sure, you're you're getting humidity up into the canopy. But if you're spraying your tree with water in the heat of the day, that's going to be just fine. That the humidity is going to dissipate right away, and you've done the job of knocking the insect pest off. Uh, but mostly, uh, mostly with this, it's going to be insecticidal soap is, is how you would treat these. Japanese beetles. Haven't been as much of a problem the past two years. And not all parts of the country have it yet. The Washington apple growers are nervous, though. Um, but uh, so this is something that we face year in and year out. And it can cause a decline in the health of a plant. Um, you know, plants mostly, they will come back from a Japanese beetle infestation. Uh, but but. They may not grow as as rapidly, and and it will stunt them for a couple of years. And and repeated annual visits from Japanese beetles can can lead to problems down the road. So you know a, a weak plant then invites other disease and other insects. So they are a, enough of a troublesome pest. Uh, they do feed on a lot of plant material. Uh, for us, they. They, they really like apples, particularly Liberty Apple, for whatever reason, raspberries, hazelnuts, grapes. They absolutely love grapes, and they love sweet cherries. So grapes are kind of the canary in the coal mine. Um, the deal with this pest is it overwinters uh, a good 10 and a half to 11 months of the year in the soil. Uh, I say overwinters. It's, uh, it spends its, its larval time period in the soil. Um, and then in, you know, for us, at least in Kansas City, it starts to emerge in early June. And that's when we start to see the damage. And you'll see with the beetle here, uh, you see the, the leaf pattern and how they basically work in amongst the veins of the leaves and they skeletonize the leaves. That's what they do. And then they feed in groups. And so all of a sudden you can have a plant that is skeletonized. Um, so some of the controls, I'm putting traps on here. And if you look at the picture, this is what's called a mass Japanese beetle trap. Uh, this was also a product of uh, Lincoln University. Uh, the, the professor that was at Lincoln University is now at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, and this is, uh, this works, uh, but, it, but it, it works in larger settings. You don't want to introduce a mass trap uh, right in your yard, your small uh, postage stamp yard. But this works when you have a, a larger orchard of 10 trees. The nice thing about this is it's able to capture 40 gallons of Japanese beetles. 
whereas a homeowner trap captures maybe a gallon of Japanese beetles. Some other things that, uh, that you can do is apply the milky spore bacteria, which is a specific bacteria uh, that, is, uh, that kills the Japanese beetles. The larva eats the bacteria and uh, the larva dies. If you're looking to protect your plants, uh, neem spray on the foliage can deter feeding and so can kale and clay. So if you have a severe problem with bees, I would look into, into some of this. Uh, I think uh, for us, at least with the drought in the past two years, uh, I, I think this year it, it, it may be another, another non-issue with the beetles. And maybe, maybe we're starting to get past them a little bit. Want to talk about some of the, the products used in pest management. Uh, we're, we're past the 10 pests, but I want to talk about just a few of these things so, so they're on your radar. Um, so horticultural oil uh, is, is uh, their, most formulations are not organic, but uh, this happens to be one. Um, this is basically a petroleum-based oil. Some people use uh, things like canola oil. As a, as a horticultural oil. Um, but the, this could be used as a dormant oil. We do recommend dormant oil, and it's something that, uh, that most, most sites would be spraying in February to early March. Uh, this can smother a lot, of, uh, a lot of overwintering insect pests, especially a lot of the small mites I haven't even talked about here, uh, or some of the aphids or parasil. Um, so just something that uh, this is, you know, have on your radar screen. BT, I mentioned this earlier, uh, a lot of gardeners know about this because this is something you would be using on your cabbage or your kale to protect against the cabbage loopers uh, or, or the, uh, uh, the crisscross moths. Um, this is a naturally occurring bacteria. It, it only works on caterpillars. So the larva of moths and butterflies so don't use this in your butterfly garden. Um, but you can use for things like oriental fruit moth, codling moth, bagworms, because um, bagworms are something that uh, you know, I think we all probably face, some of the yellow-necked caterpillars. Um, now, it doesn't harm beneficials or pollinators, but notice the asterisk there. Uh, in general, pollinating butterfly larva do not feed on target plants or fruits. So, you know, you think of, you think of monarchs, um, you, you think of some of the swallowtails. Uh, in general, uh, they're not going to be feeding on your fruit plants. Now, with pawpaws, yes, there is the zebra swallowtail butterfly, and I would say don't spray your pawpaw with BT just because of that. Zebra swallowtail is just eating the foliage, it's not eating the fruit. Um, so that's a little bit about BT. Spinosad is uh, another organic uh, insecticide, or there are a lot of organic formulations out there. Uh, it is a non-selective insecticide, so it can harm beneficials, it can harm pollinators too. Um, but it, it, it works on a number of, of these uh, different insects that we do face in the orchard. And then some of the fungicides. Um, so pretty much uh, all of the fungicides that, that we uh, recommend, they're going to work more as a preventative. Uh, you're spraying uh, before the fungus is on the plant surface. And oftentimes the best time to spray is before that rain event, before that high humidity event. Um, so copper fungicide is, is you know, that's, that's probably one of the easier ones to use. Uh, however, you don't want to overuse it, or in some cases, uh, it's not recommended to use above a certain temperature because you can cause foliar damage or you can cause fruit damage. Uh, with that copper. Sulfur uh, can be somewhat difficult to use in the wettable powder form, and it definitely leaves a residual smell. Uh, you, will, you will smell that in your orchard for a while. 
a good two weeks after, if not longer. And then neem oil, uh, it, it does have fungicidal properties uh, and it is fairly easy to use and pretty safe to use. There are some other biofungicides out there. Uh, some of the bacillus, the subtilis. Um, so these basically outcompete uh, other fungus and disease causing organisms. And here is the kale and clay that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this, you know, I do like uh, from the perspective of it's not really an insecticide, but it's just a crop protectant. Um, however, it can be very difficult to use. It's, it, it clogs sprayers. Uh, you end up using a half cup per gallon. So if, if you think about the, the measurements there, that's, that's a lot of uh, powder per gallon of water. Um, but it, it can be nice because uh, you, you can spray this three to four times during the season and have very little uh, insect predation on your fruits. Now, some, some growers complain about uh, the fact that it, it cuts, it, it can cause some problems with photosynthesis. You know, the, the, from my experience is we end up getting a lot more sunburn anyhow on our plants. So... And some apple growers will actually use this uh, to prevent sunburn on their fruits. And then here's uh, neem oil. And uh, this happens to be uh, the concentrated neem seed oil. And it's ne the necessary ingredient in the holistic spray that's used. And these are just some of the, the rates that... Uh, that, that we will use on some of those holistic sprays or throughout the growing season. And here are some of the resources and, and uh, you know, Arbico Organics is, is a, a great place for finding especially beneficial nematodes. So if you're looking for beneficial nematodes, they're the place to go. Um, Peaceful Valley sells a, a lot of uh, different uh, organic insecticides. Great, Lake, uh, Great Lakes IPM. If you need any sort of trapping supplies, any sort of monitoring supplies, pheromones, Great Lakes is the place to go. Most of the rest of these are just uh, good IPM and good fruit resources. And notice I do have our, our give and grow uh, pest identification down there at the bottom. So if you're if you're interested in that, and with that, maybe I'll leave this up, uh, and uh, I can I can take any questions if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Um, awesome. Matt, thank you. I, we've got a lot of uh, comments that says this has been really helpful. So we really appreciate you sharing your time. Um, when we'll uh, spend about 10 minutes answering questions. So if you did have one, I want to make sure everyone um, that put it in the chat gets it answered. Uh, but if you do have to hop off, no, uh, we are going to send out um, a copy of the slides, the resources, the answers to these questions. Um, and make sure you lean into your local resources. Your program managers are excellent sources of information as well. Um, so uh, when when you do close out, there'll be a little survey. It looks very similar to the one that you took when you um, were registering. Um, it's just a knowledge check to see uh, how you did coming in and how you're doing going out and make sure that we know what kind of topics you're interested in in the future. Um, so Matt, one of the questions was about uh, mulch. Wood chip mulch, uh, what's the best kind of mulch to put under trees? Yeah, so um, I mean, that, that can be, you know, a complicated question. Uh, but so if, if you look at the studies, uh, uh, most trees grow best with a wood chip mulch um, and a deciduous wood chip mulch. Now, the, the reason why I say deciduous and not coniferous is uh, a lot of the deciduous mulch it actually breaks down. And it's that process of breaking down that builds the soil. 
Uh, most coniferous mulch actually has antifungal properties within it that, that keeps it from breaking down. So it ends up just sort of drying out uh, and, and it will not break down and incorporate into the soil. Um, now, you know, in regards to, you know, as some, some people like to just put down weed mat uh, around their trees. And in some cases, you know, weed mat can actually help interrupt or disrupt uh, pest life cycles. Uh, however, you can end up with other problems when you have weed mat down below your trees. Uh, the soil does not breathe as easily because the weed mat is actually uh, keeping moisture in, uh, so you don't get the same transpiration uh, uh, in the in the soil. So, uh, but yeah, I, I'd say deciduous wood chips is is really going to be uh, your best bet. Excellent. Um, another question. It kind of gets into more specifics. Um, one was about chestnuts, uh, the Chinese chestnut, uh, and if you've seen those affected by blight around here. Yeah, so they will they will get little bits of blight, but not to the point where it, it's not something that gets into the trunk. So you'll you'll lose a limb here and there. It's uh, it's not. Most Chinese chestnuts have a, a decent resistance to blight. So now that being said, different parts of the country may be experiencing more blight pressure. And so you now here within, here basically west of the Mississippi River, uh, the, the chestnut did not exist naturally. It was not a, the American chestnut, I should say, was not native. And so the blight never, was never a problem over here. Now in a particularly blighted area of the Eastern United States, yes, chestnut blight could be more virulent and get into Chinese chestnuts more. Thank you. Um, another one is about uh, pawpaw treatment. Um, I think you pronounce it philosticta, the leaf spot or leaf blotch. Uh, is there a way to address that? Yeah, that's so that's not something you know. I would maybe refer you to either the University of Kentucky, uh, because they they have been doing a lot of research on Papa. So that's that's really, really their wheelhouse. I know uh, MU has has some uh, research fields of Papa, and that is that's something that that I know they they have issues with. Um, my guess is it's probably probably a fungicide that uh, and one it is definitely not uh, registered for organic use and, and may be somewhat difficult to find uh, for the sort of average uh, average grower. Um, yeah. but, but I would look at uh, uh, University of Kentucky um, and uh, MU may have uh, a publication on that as well. Okay. Um, and then another uh, fruit tree specific question about uh, persimmon. Um, so do occurrences of, let me see. I think it's, I wrote this down, but now I can't read my own handwriting. Um, let me see. Yeah, anthranos, is that? No, and, and, and thracnose. And thracnose. Yeah, when when you do see that, does that become uh, endemic after initial infection? Yeah, so that's another one that I don't know um, because it's it probably does uh, knowing. No, I mean anthracnose is, is a sort of a loose term for 
a lot of leaf wilt uh, that, that leads to twig damage. Um, it, my guess is it probably, pro probably is without knowing uh, the, the specific uh, disease. Oh, here. Oh, another final question is um, about uh, spotted lanternflies. Are those affecting um, any of our uh, fruit nut berries? Well, yeah. So that's uh, you know the the further northeast you get, uh, yes, uh, and so they they do they do especially like grapes. Um, but they they will they will feed on a number of different species of plants. They they seem to really like uh, a certain invasive species, the tree of heaven, and so they they will congregate there first. But they will then have spillover into orchard areas, and it, it seems like what happens more than anything it's the uh, it's all of the the their excrement that basically starts to coat the plant and leads to problems with photosynthesis uh, and also a little bit of a little bit of sap decline. It's a pest that I'm glad we don't see here yet. I know our, our days are numbered uh, in Kansas City as as people travel back and forth. Um, and and I haven't I haven't kept up with uh, how everybody in Philadelphia is doing. I you know, I'm curious how Pittsburgh is doing uh, with this if it's a problem in in uh, Western Pennsylvania yet. Excellent. All right. Well, um, that was all the questions from the chat. Uh, one. Uh, I'll I'll give another minute if anybody wants to unmute and ask Matt a question directly. Uh, hey, Keto here. Hey, hey Matt. Keto. How you doing? Uh, I'm great. Um, this has been really awesome, but it's also like a lot, I think, to navigate for the average orchardists. And I, um, I'm just wondering, I like the other way of thinking about this, you know, approaching pest pressures is to like, is like the general like the general kind of recommendations and maybe you guys have a resource that i just haven't checked out yet but i just was wondering if um you know if you had like i'd imagine there's like the, that's where you the, where the holistic spray comes in so like if there was i just imagining a listing of like you know 10 common practices you should do for orchard health and you know uh sanitation uh holistic spray uh and then like a few maybe other finer points does that exist or is that could that possibly be a topic uh or like a one pager or something for the future i i think i think sort of a well i, I would say a two page or a one a one page front and back uh <laughs> i i <laughs> No, certainly. I mean, pest management is a complicated topic, but I think it's it's uh, at the beginning, sort of uh, talking about some of the 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 principles of of integrated pest management and and the the activities of scouting, the activities of of uh, picking up fallen fruits. I think you know that's that's basic stuff that I I think everybody should be doing right. now the the thing is there's always a leaf spot there's always a hole in a fruit somewhere and so what what i might you know maybe one slide that that might be good and it's why i included this was was each individual fruit crop and breaking down what are those pests that, that we see mostly on that fruit crop? And, and then drilling down on that, that's still complicated, 
but it gives you an idea of, of what you're going to be dealing with uh, fruit crop by fruit crop. Pest management is, is, is very difficult. And I think there are a lot of things that you can just do without picking up a sprayer. And a lot of those are the cultural practices though. So, yeah. But yeah, let's, let's noodle on the, on the one pager for sure, because I think, I think there are just a lot of, a lot of uh, cultural practices that, that everybody can do uh, to limit pest pressure. Word. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. You guys getting a lot of snow up there? Uh, we got, yeah, we got a couple inches today. We, uh, it's, um, it makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was December. We had like almost six degree days a couple of times. That was a little bit uh, sad. Yeah, yeah. December was yeah unusually warm for us, and then we we had a couple uh, double digits below here lately. So uh, we're we're done with it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, great questions. Uh, like Keto said, I know it's a lot of information. We're gonna send out a follow up email. Uh, with all the resources and the answers to questions and other links to information that you might find useful. Um, lean into your your local program managers and uh, we'll we'll continue to do these in, in the future. So uh, thank you and have a great afternoon. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye.